Welcome to Recovery His Way. I'm Tom Reynolds, your host, and today I'm here with Jeremy Mitchell. Jeremy, it's good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Um, Jeremy's been a longtime friend of mine. Um, we've known each other, what, 10, 11 years? Started as a resident, um, kind of grew through the program. You've done pretty much everything here from finishing the floors down where we are to uh, um, working as a um, um, resident manager and working in the various businesses we've had and becoming program director. And uh, now you're our recovery minister and you've been working in that and really focused on um, coaching and counseling and teaching the guys. Um, you've been an excellent teacher for a long time. And now we kind of have you um, committed to going to Atlanta to begin our first um, program there. So I'm excited about all that we're doing, all that we've done together for the last number of years. And I was excited for um, our audience to kind of get to know you and, and hear your story. So I guess to start, maybe you could just give us a little brief recovery story, the Jeremy Mitchell version. Sure. So the Jeremy Mitchell version. OK, <laughs> let's see how this works. Uh, well, I mean, first off, you know, I was raised in a, a what I would consider a good home uh, in a Christian environment. It was raised in church. We had one of those families that was there on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you know, all the youth <laughs> trips, the <laughs> mission trips, all that. Um, ultimately, I still ended up in the position that I was in. I mean, even with all that, I, I love when the Bible says train up a child in the way uh, that he should go. When he grows older, he will not depart from it. Uh, it doesn't tell you when they actually get older, right? <laughs> so there's that period of time. Um, and so I made some poor decisions. Uh, I didn't I didn't uh, wake up, you know, when I was in fifth grade and I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I didn't wake up and say, you know, I'd really like to be an addict uh, and an alcoholic, uh, homeless and in the mental institutions and jails and all that. Like that wasn't my life plan. Uh, and I, but I found myself there. Um, it was a very difficult life. Like I said, you know, I was homeless in Nashville for a good period of time. Um, did a mental institution stay for a little bit, got locked up a couple of times, um, broken relationships, eviction notices, right? Um, loss of relationships, loss of friends, uh, you know, uh, a very difficult life. Uh, I chose a very difficult life, not only for me, but for my loved ones. Uh, my mother many times was basically searching uh, the internet, searching uh, obituaries and, and different, and, you know, search, searching morgues and searching uh, hospitals, expecting to find me dead because I would be out of contact for six or more months at a time. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was a horrible brother, too. I mean, I just horrible family member all around. I mean, I, I uh, remember I went on a, me a meth binge and missed my little sister's wedding, her mm -hmm. only wedding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> which is rough. I was locked up in the middle institution when my uh, one of my aunts passed away, my mother's sister, and her only uh, desire at her funeral was for me and my cousin <clears throat> to be a part of that, right? To uh, be pallbearers, and mm -hmm. they couldn't find either one of us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have I have things in my past uh, that like that, and I can remember being in a position of. Um, well, one, desperation, which is a beautiful gift. Uh, but really what the catalyst for that desperation was the loss of hope, um, which is a horrible place to be. And you know, I always, even in recovery, I mean, even in my addiction, you know, I started trying to get sober in 2003 and had uh, six or seven years more of struggles, right? And um, but I always had hope until the end. Uh, and that's a horrible place to be, but it's a beautiful one, too, because it, it creates that desperation. Uh, I can remember looking at my mother, you know, I was the guy that left my mom at, at jail. She I was in jail for 13 days and she um, came to pick me up at midnight because she found out I was getting out, right? And uh, I used a little payphone on the way out and called one of my buddies and knew he had dope. And my mother was there with her chicken noodle soup book and all that just wanted me to get me to my apartment because she knew I would have no access to anything if I just got there. And uh, I was a guy that left my mother in the parking lot and got another oh, car, right? Oh, yeah. And I remember in one part with her, I just said, you know, the devil doesn't even care about me anymore. I said, you know, I'm so far gone that he doesn't even have to pay attention. He just checks in on me every once in a while, you know, because I felt like it was done. <laughs> right. Uh, and I've become very angry with God, with the church, with all that, you know, the kind of the spiritual maturity that goes along with uh, addiction issues and um, 
I remember I, I wanted to get sober, but I didn't want to deal with God, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. And I tried everything to get sober and stay sober and have a good life. I mean, I, I mimicked other people, you know, I, I uh, got the family and, you know, got the good job and went to church like you're supposed to, but no real relationship with God, mm-hmm. you know, not right. tried other avenues, counseling, psychiatry, uh, mutual help meetings, all that stuff, but never had the relationship with God. And, uh, sorry, it's a little emotional. I should be thinking about it. Uh, and I remember my mother telling me, you know, you just need to go to his way. If you just go to his way, everything will be okay. And that was when y'all first started. And which really made me angry because they would always tell me crazy things like, you know, if you just go to church, everything will be okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, there's nothing magical about a church pew, right? Right, right? And, uh, but that's not what you're saying. You know, the relationship with God will change, change situations. Um, and I just ran out of ideas, so I came here. And I came here with the belief that if God doesn't work, then nothing's gonna work, and I'm just gonna die this way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can remember us meeting uh, for the first time in your office. Uh, and I don't remember a lot of it, you know. I was pretty toasted <laughs> at that point. But I, I remember it vividly. <laughs> you, you, you may not remember much of it. Yeah, it was funny. My mom asked me, uh, it reminded me of things two years later that happened in that meeting that I wasn't aware of. I'm like, wow, you didn't kill me in that situation? Uh, but you asked me, you know, what was it that I was here to get? And my response was incredibly arrogant looking back at it. Um, but what I said was, <clears throat> You know, I know how to get sober. I, I, I'm not here to do that. I've gotten sober a, a thousand and one times, right? Mm-hmm. Getting, getting sober is not the difficult part. I said, the problem is I can't stay sober um, because I hate my life. I hate myself. I'm miserable, mm-hmm. you know, and I keep doing the same things sober. And I said, I believe that's because I uh, don't have a relationship with God and I no longer know how to have one. And so that's what I'm here to get. And the arrogant part of that statement was, uh, I no longer know how to have one. The reality was is that I never knew how to have one. If I did, I more than likely would not be in the position right. that I was in. Right, right, right. right? Uh, so in, as far as recovery is concerned, you know, we got to that point and uh, my recovery was pursuit of Christ. You know, and I, I tell guys and, and tell people, you know, it was in that early process that I became a Christian for real, you know, and it was in that process that I tried to learn. I, I figured out I was in an identity crisis and I mm-hmm. wanted to learn what my identity was, but mm-hmm. not not from a world perspective, but what God said about me. And I learned more about, you know, a little bit more about who God was and how he viewed us. And so it changed my view of people. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh We've been together for some days now, uh, been through ups and downs and difficult times, right? And right. I've had struggles and scary moments and all that good stuff, but God does work. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, I mean, there were plenty of tools that God blessed me with to help me learn and to grow, but that was what has always been missing. Right. You know, it, it strikes me, I mean, obviously having been here for a long time now, you've kind of almost done about everything imaginable that could be done out here. Um, and one of the things I know we've talked a lot about is kind of what your motivations are. You're talking about your motivations originally come here, desperation, the gift of desperation and those kind of things. And then now growing over the last 10 years here, um, what have been some of the real key values, the key decisions, the key um, thought processes that have helped you personally grow in, in the ways you have in this journey? Sure. Well, that's a great question. So many things, but I can remember there were some very defining moments in my life. And I think that you and I, when I discovered them, I actually talked about them, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and luckily, uh, my family has, uh, they call it Bain stubbornness. It comes from my granddaddy's side, of, my mom's side of the family. Uh, we're very stubborn people. It's so when we get, we get our minds made on something, that's just what we do. And mm-hmm. so... Uh, coming to these understandings or discovering these things uh, with being a little bit stubborn really helped me (laughs) go a good distance. I guess the first one was when I was um, studying the Word of God and I was in the Old Testament and I was reading the story about Moses, right? And um, and, uh, 
like, I mean, I've heard the story 10,000 times probably. And I got to the part where after the burning bush and God is telling Moses, you know, this is what I need you to do. This is what you're going to do. And Moses came up with all these excuses uh, of why it's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because it seems like Moses kind of runs out of excuses. And then he says, dear Lord, please send someone else. That was his final response, right? Yeah. I, I have I have run out of good ideas to change this direction. Let me just put it out here plainly. In the very next verse, it changed my life forever. It said, and then God's anger burned against Moses and scared me to death. <laughs> absolutely scared me because I remembered the life that I came from uh, and how horrible it is. I don't... You know, I woke up in a world where every morning I woke up, I was cursing mad because I woke up, because I knew what it meant. Mm -hmm. You know, right, right. I mean, it was a horrible existence just to just to regret waking up and having to go through that again. I was like, you know what? If my life, the way I just came from, if it's anything like God's anger burning against me, I don't want to have anything to do with it. So I made a decision in my life. I remember coming and talking to you about it. <clears throat> In which I said, uh, this is it. If, if there's a man or woman that I believe or perceive to be uh, children of God, ask me to do something for the kingdom, for the community, uh, for the promotion of, of God's plan and God's will, the answer is yes. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and it will always be yes. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if I know how to do it or I don't know how to do it. It doesn't matter if I think I'm good at it or I'm not good at it. it None of that matters. It's just, this is what's been put in front of me, so let's do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I told you that, and I remember, and then it just immediately kept getting put to the test, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like teaching. You brought up teaching for a while. I was horrible. I mean, I don't think I'm all that great now, but I was horrible at teaching at the beginning. And I, I truly believe that I had no business teaching, uh, but it kept being asked of me here and at Central Church of Christ and other you know avenues to do public speaking. And it actually, I mean, I was so against it that it took me probably a year and a half of doing it to buy into, hey, this might be part of God's plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People just kept asking me right, to do right, it. Right, right. Uh, and it's just so many things like that, right? Um, and so that's kind of, that was one of the blocks that, that, that kind of started this journey. The other one was I wanted a Christ-centered life. This is a Christ-centered program. I wanted a Christ-centered life. So everything that I do, I try to make the focus the kingdom, the kingdom mm -hmm. of God, Jesus Christ, right. all that. For example, being a life coach, right? <clears throat> Doing that certification. Mm -hmm. A godly man came to me and said, hey, I think uh, with what you're good at, I think that you you should be a life coach. And I was like, I don't even know what that means, man. But mm -hmm. okay, let's do that. Uh, but I don't want to be a life coach. I want to be a uh, Christian life coach, right? <laughs> I want to mm -hmm. do it right. from this avenue. Right, right. Um, I want to teach recovery, but I don't want to just teach recovery. I want to teach biblical recovery. Like everything mm -hmm. is trying to make that focus, right? right? I mean, even finding my wife was, it came from a, you know, I want to go on vacation. Well, let's make it a Christian vacation. Let's go do missionary work right, right, uh, right. somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Let's let's have a different focus in our life. So that was that was a big one. And then the final one I would say is when all this was going on, like, I'm a new creation. I'm a new person. I have a new life, but I have old person memories. So I know who I was. Um, and that can be very burdensome. That can be very harmful to know that. And when people were asking me to do these things, it's like, man, why? Do they not know who I am? I'm a horrible person. This I have no business doing this. Why? Like teaching? Oh, my goodness. It's like, you know, I was... I mean, I failed for everything on the drug test except for PCP when I came in here. Why in the world am I teaching a Bible class? <laughs> um, but, you know, I found 1 Corinthians chapter 1, right? Um, which it, it basically states that God didn't choose the, you know, the noble things, the powerful things, the wise things. He basically chose everything that wasn't, you know, to nullify the things that are so that uh, God could get the credit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that was huge because mm -hmm. it's just kind of like really doesn't matter where I came from. Um, it doesn't matter what I'm good at or what I'm not good at. It just matters that I'm in a relationship with God and to be willing to allow him to use me the way right. he wanted to.
Right. Well, I mean, in this process, I mean, I've known you a long time and you've always said yes to pretty much anything that was asked of you. And you've done it with a Christ-centered passion um, and, you know, didn't go into it thinking that you knew what you were doing as much as you were willing to become whatever that took. And now we've asked you to go start our first um, recovery planting ministry in Atlanta. Um, I guess I was interested in, you know, why did you say yes to that? What did you, what do you envision that to be? Why did you commit to think? I mean, you're from Huntsville all your life. And so um, this is where your family is, this is where your life has been, you know, and now you're going to uproot all that um, with a wife and baby and, and one on the way and move to Atlanta. What motivates that? Well, that's a great question. Um, it's, it's so funny because my answer is going to make me sound insane. Okay. And, uh, but, I, but I guess it doesn't okay. surprise me one bit. Right. Uh, yeah, I've been here. I'm, you know, 40 years old. Um, I lived in Nashville, I think, for a couple of years. I don't even know. I didn't draw a sober breath the entire time I was there. And I lived in Florida, you know, played, you know, playing college basketball. I would say going to college, but I really wasn't participating in education. I was just <laughs> bouncing a ball and going to the beach. Mm -hmm. And that was for like a semester or two semesters. And so outside of that, I've been here the whole time. And I'm fairly comfortable here. Uh, you know, I've got a great position here at His Way. You know, I have a, a great position of service uh, in a congregation here in North Alabama. I have, uh, I have a nice house. You know, I got the family. I've got a good reputation in town. You know, I have uh, re the resources are very readily available to me, mm -hmm. uh, so I don't really have to worry about much. So, it's insane for me to to walk away from that. Um, <laughs> just to be honest, mm -hmm. um, but God, people that I perceive to be godly men and my brothers in Christ said, "Hey, we would like for you to go do this. We need you to go do this." So the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I know that sounds insane, but that's that's what it is. I mean, I, right. I mean, how else am I supposed to know what I'm supposed to do? Right. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't expect God to be to send me a burning bush, but I do believe He has people around me all the time mm -hmm. that present opportunities that He desires for me to do something with. Right. And quite frankly, I I believe in the model that's been created out here. Right, I believe in the religious freedom. I believe in um, the the focused on Christ and and just the Bible, um, focusing on what the Word of God says and not tradition and things like that. Right, um, and it's successful. And I believe that you know there are more people that could benefit from this than just people in Huntsville, Alabama. And I know that people are dying every single day. From this, you know, addiction pandemic, if you will, right? right. <laughs> the Absolutely. pandemic right now that seems like sometimes people have forgotten mm -hmm. in our with our current situation. Right. Um, but people need help. People are right. dying. You know, people relationships are being ripped apart. Lives are being ripped apart. Right. I know. I know. This week you've been interviewing guys. You know, as we put together this team and looking at what's it take to commit yourself to do this type of thing, and so you've been. And I'm talking to a lot of the guys who have, are expressing interest in going with you to Atlanta, um, thinking about what you've gone through, what it takes for you. And, you know, as we talk about people volunteering, working in ministry, getting involved in this, we're talking about Christians kind of coming up out of the pew and finding a place of involvement in recovery ministry. I guess I was interested in what kind of things are you looking for that you think make for successful um, commitment to recovery ministry? What are the things that you, qualities you're looking for in the, the guys you're interviewing? That's a great question. I, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I think that maybe the answer I'm supposed to give is I'm looking for what people can offer the program, what people can bring to the table to help change these lives. I think that's like the answer people are expecting. Um, but it's not really my answer because I believe that everybody that has enough heart to actually come up and, and pick up the phone and call us or uh, the people that turn in applications and sit before us are all going to have, to some degree, a desire to help somebody. Mm -hmm. But what I'm interested in is what is it that you expect? What is it that you desire to gain from this? You know, what is it that you walk away with? Mm -hmm. what it, what, you know, how does it change your life? You know, how does it help you develop as a human being? Have mm -hmm. you thought about that? Mm -hmm. 
you and I had a conversation. I, I, you know, it, we've had a lot of conversations over the years. <laughs> and uh, and the, the ones that I consider really smart ones, I tend to remember. And this is one of those. You had made a statement to me years ago. Uh, I don't remember where it came from, but you said, I wonder, I, don't, I wonder if God didn't give us the homelessness problem for us to fix homelessness, but you gave us, he gave us the homelessness problem to fix what's wrong with us. You know, I think we had mm -hmm. a, a, a mm -hmm. resident who had come from right, homelessness right, when we right. were talking about that. And that struck me, mm -hmm. you know. Maybe God didn't give us the addiction problem to fix it. Maybe that's not what he's looking for. Maybe he's just using that as an avenue for us to grow mm -hmm. just through trying to help. You right, know? right, right. So that getting involved, so many people are intimidated by the idea of getting involved because I don't know what to do to fix it. And, right. you know, we've been doing this, you know, for, I've been doing it for 14 years here and then another um, 10 or so years before that. And yet I never got into this because I thought I had the magic formula on how to fix it as much as it was a compassionate response of God's grace to people who are hurting. And and then realizing it really is changing us more than it's changing them in many ways. And so, you know, really having a vision for that, I think is great in terms of what you're looking for in the people that are going there that really ultimately, it's not about fixing the addiction problem, being trained or equipped well enough to be this professional tech, but am I willing to be transformed? I'm willing to be changed. Am I willing to let this process change me and right. become what God wants me to be, I think is a great perspective to take. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it's about. I mean, if you're, if you're a person who believes that you have, some, to some degree, a capacity to love somebody mm -hmm. else, then bring that. Mm -hmm. Right. Just love. We'll figure out everything else as we go. Right. You know, I, I right. remember I, I spent so many years before I figured out why y'all actually hired me, which took a while. Uh, <laughs> I kept being worried of like, you know, one day I'm going to wake up and go to work and everybody's going to figure out that I actually have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is y'all, y'all already knew I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but you wanted me to be me in that arena. Right. 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 And allow right. it to develop me. And by way of me developing, other people benefit from it. Right. 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 Well, I think, you know, when you think about planting something, I mean, we got six acres here. We have a number of buildings. We were blessed to kind of find a good location where we started with a fairly good sized building and it's developed from there. So we have this kind of one campus kind of thing. Sure. And I know as we look at transplanting that other places, it's hard to find the kind of location that would model this. And I know in Atlanta, we're doing a little bit different. I was wondering if you could kind of share kind of what the Atlanta model is at this point, what you're, how you're seeing that, because I think that is a much more, you know, we need to be flexible to realize that it may look different things mm -hmm. in different communities depending upon the opportunities and the needs. Sure, so, I mean, the model, the His Way model is not six acres and four residential buildings and a commercial building. The model is the people. It's like, it's like church, right? I mean, we teach kids, you know, here's the steeple, you know, mm -hmm. beside here are the people and all right, that. Right. It's like the church isn't the building. The church is the body of Christ. Wherever you go, the church is. Right. 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 And uh, I think that if you can, if you, if you think from the, at the model, from the, from the, from the position of people in a position of community and culture, then it can be very similar. Yes. It will look different on the outside, but to the heart of things, it should be relatively the same, mm -hmm. you know? Um, like for instance, with the Atlanta model, I mean, we, yeah, we have everything on one campus here, um, in Atlanta, at least in the beginning, it's going to be separate, right? So we'll have our residential area mm -hmm. where we'll have everybody living together, a lot like this model here, but we'll have to transport back and forth between a commercial building that will not be directly on site. We'll be a little bit down the road, um, and do our classes there and our family meetings and intakes and anything else we have to do. So right. it'll be separate, but the model is still there because mm -hmm. the model is not the commercial building and the residential building. The mm -hmm. model is the Christ-centeredness uh, within the staff that is extended uh, to each and every person that steps on any of our properties. Right, right. Amen. That's great. And and that's something that can be duplicated anywhere. Do you, right. you can do it in a church building. You can do it in a community center. You can do it in all kinds of places and different kinds of ways is to just simply make the message of the gospel of hope available. You know, we think about hope and, and dreams and kind of where we're going. Obviously, you're moving your family to Atlanta. 
Um, you have stated that getting involved with this is really more about you changing and growing than it is about how many people are impacted in Atlanta or what's going to happen there specifically. What kind of things do you envision or dream of or hope for as you go to Atlanta, um, both in terms of the ministry, but also in terms of your family, you, what you dream of, what do you imagine this is going to do for you guys? Um, that's kind of a two-part question, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I've been very blessed uh, on the family side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been very blessed. Uh, I have a wife that is probably more ministry focused than I am. Okay. <laughs> All right. Wow. Uh, yeah, I am the. Uh, I was the the kid that was the rebel without a cause. You know, rebelling mm -hmm. when there was nothing to rebel against, <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, did everything exactly opposite of the way I was taught. My wife was was the type that grew up in the church and did everything she was taught and did her best to honor God mm -hmm. in her situations from a very young age. Mm -hmm. And so she's very uh, ministry focused. So she makes it very easy to make this transition, right? Uh, she's already actually made a sacrifice of uh, sacrificing everything just to be in this relationship. Right, so right. this is actually right. pretty small compared to that. Right. Um, but I think, I think us having the opportunity to really get involved in ministry again together more so than we are here mm -hmm. is really going to help us uh, to be uh, to grow as a couple, not mm -hmm. only as individuals. Um, and being the fact that it is a brand new program is going to take a lot of involvement with me and my wife. Mm -hmm. My son is going to be able, and my future child, uh, boy or girl, we don't know yet, mm -hmm. um, I imagine will be more involved in that ministry as well. So they're going to be impacted by mm -hmm. being able to see the consequences of life right, and right. also the redemption, God's redemption, right? And the power of reconciliation right. and the power of community. They're going to see those things. So I think... Mm -hmm. I think as a family, as a whole, we're going to grow. I have no idea what that looks like. I don't, I don't know what that outcome is going to be. I just believe right. that it's going. We're going to be better for it. Right. It's kind of an interesting transition for you because I know for many years you lived here on site. You mm -hmm. lived on property. How many years was that? It's about six. About six of the ten years you were involved. S six days, three hours, and seventeen hours, <laughs> give or take. No. <laughs> but I mean, so you've been, you've lived on this in this recovery world. And now you're going to be going to Atlanta in which you and your family are going to be once again living in that same environment. You're going to be living in the residential facility that the residents are going to be occupying various, um, you know, apartments in. Sure. Um, so it's definitely going to be kind of an immersion again back into kind of what you evolved in there. And it'll be exciting to see how you as a family come together because right now it's, you know, leave the house every day. You drive out here and are involved, and then you go back home. Yeah. This is something where it's gonna be really the whole family immersed in this experience, at least at the beginning. Right. Um, so that's that's exciting and, and will be challenging, I'm sure. <laughs> but it'll be great too, in terms of the witness that you'll be able to bring, because uh, obviously, as you know, many of the guys who come into recovery are coming from broken homes and, um, and divorces and you know aren't with their children and have a lot of loss in their life and so you having the opportunity to model that um, restored family and redeemed family um, for them will be an important part of the christ-centered testimony yeah. that they get to see and experience because you know i know we talk about out here the idea that we really want um, the seeds of the gospel to be planted and we believe that anybody who comes whether here for a day or come here for a year that's going to happen in their experience. And a lot of that comes from their observations, what they see, what they experience here. It's not just that a Bible verse is read to them. It's they see the gospel lived out in, in between people, in attitudes of people, in marriages and in interactions with different people as well. So you have a chance to do that. Well, I guess I appreciate you being here and I appreciate what you're doing. I'm excited, obviously, and, and hope that everybody is praying for your work as we have been for a long time in Atlanta. Um, I guess... Um, as we think about this idea of volunteering and just the idea that Christians are choosing to get involved in ministry of recovery, whether it's church in their local community, whether it's helping to plan something, whether it's volunteering here at His Way or wherever it is, what any words of encouragement you'd give to just somebody who's a Christian who says, man, I'd like to do something that makes a difference in people's lives? Sure. Well, I guess number one, you can't mess it up. I, you know, it's, you, you can't mess you, you you can't really mess it up if you're trying. Yes, you'll make mistakes. Yes, you'll 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 right. learn from right. it. But don't be scared to make a mistake. Okay. 
get your hands dirty. Mm -hmm. You know, get out there, and uh, it's okay that you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's it's not about you know just necessarily. Yes, the solution is Jesus Christ. It, it always is, and you deliver Jesus Christ. But you're not you are you are not the solution. Mm -hmm. And so relax, get in there and do what God called us to do. Mm -hmm. You know, be salt, be light, love, be love. You know, forgive, extend grace, extend mercy, um, serve. Uh, you know, carry a big serving towel and uh, just enjoy the opportunities that God places in front of you. If you don't know what they are, let's say you're watching this and you have not had any kind of uh, anything dr drawing you towards recovery ministry. Uh, if you don't know what they are, God will put people in your life to to give you opportunities to serve and right. just become a yes man or a yes woman and just say, yeah, I'll do that. Right, I, don't, right. I don't know how to do it, and I don't know why I need to do it, right. but just, just get involved. Right. Yeah, so often we overthink all these things and overanalyze them instead of just make ourselves available and let God work out the rest, right. which is what he's done in your life. And I'm so very proud of what God's doing and what he'll continue to do with you. So thanks for being here today, Jeremy, and thanks for being a special part of my life, a special part of His Way's story as you continue to pour your life into this story that God's building in you and through you. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for listening and viewing today. If you're interested in more about His Way, you can check out our website at hiswayinc.org.